Good evening. My name is Bart Worden, and I am the Executive Director for the American Ethical Union. And I'm very happy to be bringing tonight's program to this gathering of people from the Humanist Society of Iowa in Des Moines and the Secular Humanists of Iowa City. It's winter solstice, and so we thought it fitting to have a program on winter holidays, which is something our presenter, Mike French, is happy to talk about. Dr. Michael S. French is an ethical culture leader and an active member of the National Leaders Council of the American Ethical Union. He served as leader of the Baltimore Ethical Society from 1975 to 1984, and is currently affiliate minister at the First Unitarian Church in Baltimore. An historian by training, Michael is a graduate of Drake University and has taught history at a number of colleges. Until his 2007 retirement, he worked in health policy at the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Mike is also a storyteller, English country dancer, concertina player, urban bicyclist, and a good friend. Tonight, Mike will be speaking about winter holiday traditions and how they relate to humanists and humanism. The title for his talk is Deck the Hall, Humanist Winter Celebrations holiday traditions that humanists may want to celebrate. So welcome, Mike. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was saying to Warren beforehand, uh, when he checked in early, I'm sort of glad to be back in Iowa, if only virtually. Uh, I'm a graduate of Drake University. I spent, uh, you know, four great years in Iowa. I have wonderful memories of Iowa and just, uh, I even sometimes will use Google Earth and go back and look at my old haunts in Des Moines, which have been much changed since I've graduated, but much of the world has changed since I graduated. In any event, let's talk about December. I love December festivities. I love the outdoor lights. I love people getting together to enjoy each other's company and I love the seasonal charitable impulse. I love wishing people happy holidays and season's greetings. I'll wish people Merry Christmas too, even though it's not my holiday. I have strong memories of what our culture calls the Christmas season, the frozen landscapes of Iowa, Northern Illinois, where I lived, working in my family's clothing store for the Christmas rush being forced as a Jewish child in public school to sing Christmas carols. Christmas was a big presence in my life, but it wasn't then and it isn't now my holiday. It took me a long time to get in the spirit of the dark time of the year festivities. Decorating the house with lights was not part of my childhood experience. That was for other people. Now I love the lights. I call them winter lights, not Christmas lights, and we keep them up until it seems light enough in the evening for us not to need them, which is usually March. What made it possible for me to enter into this seasonal experience was just that. It was a seasonal experience that didn't belong to a particular religious tradition. Indeed, it belongs actually to a whole bunch of religious traditions. People celebrate holidays in December and early January because those times call for celebration. And the age old key to that celebration is the winter solstice, which brings us together tonight. We are going to explore a natural development, the solstice and the changes associated with it, and the meanings that people give to the period around the solstice. So my task this evening is to talk about how we can elicit more meaning and joy and usefulness from this part of the winter season, or rather not so much elicit, but how we can put more meaning into it and more joy into it. How does a humanist get the most out of this season? This is an important question because as a community, that's what we're about, finding out how to get the most out, not only of this season, but out of life. So let's consider what people have done to lighten the dark, this dark time in the years through all the years through the ages. There are two things to keep in mind about seasonal celebrations. First, they are associated with real changes in the world, both in terms of light and temperature. 
the earth tips in relation to the sun, and all sorts of things happen. Most notably, right now, the hours of daylight increase. This is a purely natural occurrence. It will continue to occur even after our species disappears from the planet. Second, people have located important events in the story of their religion in this season. These events, whether they actually happened or not, are located in the meaningful season. This is the human response to the season. We add metaphor to the natural occurrence. Archaeologists have found architectural remnants, burial mounds and standing stones. And the most famous standing stones, I suppose, are, are, is Stonehenge you know, outside of Salisbury in England. These, they've erected these burial mounds and standing stones aligned to the rising solstice sun, some of them dating back 7,000 years. Think of the years of observation and then the engineering that went into creating a structure that the sun illuminates the interior of only on one particular day of the year. These, these structures are found all over Europe. I could give architectural and ritual examples from other parts of the world, but that would you know, provide more examples than we need here for our purposes tonight. And they did not influence the culture that you and I live in as much as the primarily European examples I've given and I'm about to give. Because our culture has been shaped by the Christian calendar, we think of this as the Christmas season, but it is a celebratory time for other religions as well. Buddhists celebrate December 8th as the date the Buddha began his search for enlightenment under the body tree. Hence, it is often called the in English, Body Day. On December 26th, the Zoroastrians, also called the Parsi, commemorate the death of their prophet and founder, Zarathustra. And of course, the Yule celebration on the winter solstice is an important date for neo-pagans and Wiccans. Indeed, there is an even more ancient and still practiced Persian holiday called shab i yalda celebrated on December 21st, still today from Iran to Azerbaijan and wherever people from those countries have settled. And of course, the Jewish eight-day festival Hanukkah, because of the lunar calendar, starts on various days in December. And if you're keeping track of birthdays, you're in for a busy month. So many gods had December birthdays that in the third century, a Roman Emperor Aurelian, who ranged from 270 to 275 of the Common Era, established a single festival for all of them. What date did he pick? December 25th. These included Mithra, the sun god, who was attended by shepherds when he was born in Persia. How about that? Dionysus, the Greek god, born of a virgin, who was killed and resurrected after three days. And of course, Jesus, who had a similar story. However, some early Christians celebrated Jesus' birth on, on January 6th, the birthday of the Greek god Aeon, also called Kronos, who was also born of a virgin. The Orthodox Church still celebrates uh, Christmas on, on January 6th. So various cultures and religions, and I've only done a few here, have clustered important religious events on or adjacent to the solstice. Indeed, Christmas is likely in December because the Roman holiday Saturnalia, the feast of Saturn, uh, was in this to the Romans 10th month. You know, December means 10th month. Uh, so, you know, if you actually, if, if you read the, you know, the, what the Christians call the New Testament, you can, you see, you know, this, this is not a winter, winter when things, these things are going on. You don't have lambs out in the, in the, in the fields in, 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 in December. They're not born then. From anyway, from this, you can see that we don't celebrate at this time of the year because it's Christmas or whatever other holiday you want to talk about, but we celebrate Christmas at this time of the year because this is the time of the year that we celebrate. So, we celebrate Christmas, the dominant winter holiday in our culture, in December, but it is clearly more than a Christian religious observance. 
It's a many faceted holiday. Christmas is a seasonal celebration marked by religious observance, secular celebration, and by commerce. Indeed, Christmas is a major gift giving and shopping occasion in non-Christian Japan. The key thing here is that many of the best loved manifestations of this time of the year, though products of a Christian culture, are not particularly Christian or conventionally religious. This is not to deny that to many people it is a deeply religious time of the year and that Christmas is a deeply spiritual experience. Indeed, I'm going to argue that we humanists of our various labels can and should bring our ethical and, I'll use the term, spiritual approach to the season. But right now, let's consider the secular, or at least not conventionally religious joys of the season. Many of our most cherished customs predate Christianity, or are at best adjacent to it. You know, we've got Neanderthal in our DNA, and pagan in our religious bloodstream. I'm sure you already know about Christmas trees, holly and ivy, and mistletoes. Caroling, which we associate with Victorian top hats and bonnets, can be traced to roaming agricultural workers extorting strong drink from householders during the slack time of the year. Uh, actually, it's kind of extortion by song, you know. Come, you give us, hey, invite us in, give us stuff to drink and eat. Uh, or maybe we're going to do stuff uh, to your yard. Many of our culture's strongest images of the holiday, such as the courier and I views, Ives views of, you know, over the river and through the snowy woods, and the family gathered around the table to feast, strike themes that warm the hearts of even the most secular. These gatherings, so fundamentally connective, are not necessarily Christian, but can be deeply religious, deeply religious however you define religious, and are worthy of emulating by even the most secular. Human connection is a high value in my religious humanist life. If anything, the December holidays are holidays of connection, connection to our material world as the earth travels about the sun, connection to family and friends and neighbors, and most importantly, to strangers both near and far. It's one of those times a year when you can greet strangers on the street and wish them happiness. And my social activist self finds great meaning in the seasonal call for charitable giving, which reminds us that not everyone is as, a, is as fortunate as we are. For example, there's a broadside ballad originally collected in Yorkshire, England in the 19th century, on this theme of charitable giving. The first verse begins, cold winter is come with its cold chilling breath and the leaves are all gone from the trees. And it goes on a bit and the verse ends with the plea, the plea when in plenty you are sitting by the, your warm fireside, that's the time to remember the poor. Each verse ends in similar fashion. That's the time to remember the poor. You will tremble to think of the poor. And finally, then the rich must remember the poor. This reminds us that for those of us without, you know, for the, reminds us rather for those without a warm fireside, winter is not all sleigh ride and gift giving frolic. But it is also about the warm fireside too and the capacity for humans of different beliefs to come together. Do you know the Dar Williams song, The Christians and the Pagans? You can find it on YouTube, and I tried to post the, the URL in the uh, chat, but it didn't work. The song begins with the pagan Amber calling her Christ-loving uncle. We're up here for the holiday. Jane and I were having solstice. Now we need a place to stay. In the next verse, her uncle replies, it's Christmas Eve. I know our life is not your style. Amber responds, Christmas is like solstice, and we miss you, and it's been a while. In the course of an awkward dinner, the uncle notices how much his niece looks like his brother, with whom he hasn't spoken in a year, and resolves to call him. The final chorus is, 
So the Christians and the pagans sat together at the table, finding faith and common ground the best that they are able, lighting trees in darkness, learning new ways from the old, making sense of history, and drawing warmth out of the cold. I call that a chorus, it's the verse. But making sense of history and drawing warmth out of the cold. Drawing warmth out of the cold, making the seasonal and the human connection. This, to me, is what December is about. Like any holiday, even the most frantic ones, it commands us. It says, stop, pay attention. Pay attention to the natural world. Pay attention to each other. Treat each other with kindness. Our most beloved seasonal tales have this theme. Consider Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Scrooge is not converted by images of the nativity, but by a dawning self-awareness of how his life was affecting him and those close to it. Dickens didn't describe it this way, but according to the late geriatrician and psychiatrist, Dr. Jean Cohn, Scrooge, Scrooge was a depressed old man beset by a variety of physical ailments. He responded to a home visit by a multidisciplinary team of three consultants using psychodynamic dream therapy. This favorite Christ, Christmas story does not tell us to seek reconciliation to God or Jesus, but to our fellow human beings, to share our abundance with them. And in this way, find a fuller life for ourselves, a great humanist story. Add Scrooge to your book of uh, people converted by a humanist insight. Finally, to round this out, tradition gives us permission to celebrate the season with lights, parties, and what we today call adult beverages. Consider that great seasonal song, Deck the Hall. The tune is 16th century Welsh, the usual English words were written by a 19th century Scot, and Christmas is only mentioned incidentally and not at all in some versions. Consider these words, I'm not gonna sing and I'm admitting, omitting most of the fa-la-las. Deck the hall with boughs of, uh, boughs, boughs of holly. There's that pagan symbol. Tis the season to be jolly. Fill the mead cup, drain the barrel. Troll the ancient Christmas carol, fa la 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 la. And some versions eliminate Christmas altogether, substituting troll the ancient Yuletide carol, another pagan re reference. And succeeding versions mention nice clothing, singing, and yet more drinking. Well, what's a humanist to do? Answer celebrate. I've spent a lot of my time talking about seasonal celebrations and how wonderful the major ones celebrated in our country can be, even if it's not our own celebration. The question is, how can humanists do the same thing everyone else has done through history? That is, how can we enhance our lives by creating ways to be together that are in accord with our worldview? I think I hope that we'd want to do more than just the fa la la part. We can enjoy the connection and the celebrating and let it go at that, letting the traditional religion, uh, traditions of others just pull us along, or we can add our own deep meaning to the season. Can humanists develop seasonal celebrations, rituals, if you will, that are consonant with our beliefs? Yes, of course, absolutely. Indeed, I believe that we not only can, but we must. Not every individual humanist will find this to their taste, and every single, in, in every single individual need not. But I believe that humanist communities must do so if they want to develop a deep and sustaining community, and one that helps build a world-saving ethic. Indeed, I think that unless we do so, our humanism will be a shallow and unattractive thing. We do what people through the ages have done. 
use our view of the world to express and heighten our feelings of awe, celebration, and fellow feeling at this time of the year. This is an entirely human endeavor. So the question becomes, how do we do this? Well, we have one model with Kwanzaa, an invented holiday with genuine meaning to many and one as real as any of the ancient festivals. Milana Karenga, an African-American activist, invented the holiday in 1966. A long time ago, I know, to younger people, but not so ancient, to quote, quote, to give blacks an alternative to the existing holiday of Christmas and an opportunity to celebrate themselves and their history rather than simply imitate the practice of the dominant society, close quote. So Kwanzaa is observed from December 26th to January 1st. It's modeled after African harvest festivals, although the lighting of a candle each night of its seven day observance suggests a borrowing from Hanukkah, and there's nothing wrong with that. Rather than an alternative to Christmas, many African-American Christians celebrate both Christmas and Kwanzaa. It's a successful holiday. It's a successful and creative development of a new and meaningful December holiday. So add it to the list of all the others. And then there's also the human light holiday celebrated on December 23rd or adjacent dates, which, in, which the New Jersey Humanist Network founded in 2001 as a secular alternative to the religious holidays of the season. It's been endorsed by many organizations, including the American Humanist Association, and I understand the American Ethical Union, but can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Human light has not attracted the popularity of Kwanzaa. Uh, and I've, I've only attended one gathering, and while it was not quite to my taste, it seemed meaningful to many. I think the best season rituals grow out of congregational efforts. And here I'm using congregation to apply to ethical societies and humanist chapters and whatever, what other communities of, of humanists call themselves. There are plenty of rituals online and in books for you to borrow from, uh, but the process of creating can be extraordinary. I'll hold up this. This is one book that I like and rely on in, uh, in Nature's Honor. It was written by Pat, Patricia Montley, a friend of mine in Baltimore, who is a, a former nun and is now a Unitarian. Is a professor of was a professor of drama, um, so we can create these things. Don't be afraid of borrowing from the rich array of traditions. Don't be afraid of using metaphor and even myth. For years, I've played the role of Mr. Winter in the Winterfest services that the First Unitarian Church of Baltimore has been conducting for years. In that role, I often had dialogue with an invented character called the Lord of the Forest who represented the warmer seasons. We've used music, skits, and personal reflection to deepen our understanding and feeling, not just for the season, but, but for life. A group of us developed this service many years ago to provide humanist and, although this seems at first an odd pairing, to, to provide new humanist and neo-pagan expression of the season. Many ethical societies have devised their own celebrations. The Washington Ethical Society's Winter Festival has even attracted media attention. It's become uh, quite a big thing in Washington. I find the best energy and the richest ideas arise when we keep in mind the point I made earlier about seasonal celebrations. They are about real changes in the world to which people attached their own meanings. So first, there's the reality of seasonal change. The earth tilts in relation to the sun. Our daylight hours begin to lengthen. The thermal changes associated with spring are still months distance, but change is afoot. We humans and other animals and plants begin to respond to these changes. We do nothing to bring these changes on. We can screw up our client, but we, climate, but we can't change the tilt of the earth. We can only invest it with meaning. Some of the season is fun and frolic. 
and some of it is homeless people freezing on grates or in encampments. These are our fellow humans. It's time to remember the poor. It's time to really think about nature, how the dark and cold are not bad things, but are necessary for some forms of life, that winter is necessary for the great cycle of life. Similarly, spring is not only a time of growth and rebirth, but for many plants and animals is a time of danger when young plants and animals are at risk from predators and sudden changes in the weather. And I certainly don't need to tell you Iowans about the perils of weather, winter or summer. And then there's also this other thing, the meaning that we invest in the season, our metaphoric use for it. The dark and cold are real, but they can also be used metaphorically. In one winter fest service that I was involved with, we, we considered the dark times in people's lives and invited people to offer their own stories. In another, we noted that most of what we see when we look up to the starry winter sky is dark matter, is unknown. This, uh, one, this uh, year we explored uh, how we cluster together in community but still need to retain our individual identity. And by the way, that balancing of community and individual identity is something that I think ethical culture does very well. Certainly a ripe theme for a winter exploration is the ethical implications of how we keep warm and what that does to the earth. Seasonal change is a time for fun and frolic. We feel it, it's natural but it can also be a time for ethical reflection. Time changes. What are we doing with our lives? What are we doing to the world? The seasons don't care about us. We care about the seasons. We are the ones who give meaning to the changing seasons. We have more knowledge of astronomy and earth science than our Neolithic ancestors did. But just as they did, we observe the seasons and give meaning to them. And that is the human key. The time of the year that comes unbidden calls for the invention of meaning. Winter solstice provides the occasion. It is our job to provide the human meaning, just as religions have done for thousands of years. So let's get to work. And now it's time for me to get to listen to you. Thank you.